My guest today is a physicist. Uh, he researched consciousness together with Bob Monroe in the 1970s. And he has written a seri series of books called My Big Toe, My Big Th Theory of Everything. Welcome, Thomas Campbell. Thank you, Timo. <laughs> um, uh, Tom, you have written your theory of everything in which you have combined your knowledge about physics and your knowledge about consciousness. Um, according to your theory, uh, consciousness is a fundamental building block of, well, of the universe, of everything, and the physical world is derived from it. It exists within mm -hmm. the consciousness. Um, you see consciousness as an information system, as an information processing system, which mm -hmm. um, tries to um, decrease the entropy as a measure of disorder of this information. Consciousness so strives to reduce the entropy. And in this process, it has split off into parts and created this physical reality, well, as a simulation or as, as something within the consciousness, so to say. Mm -hmm. As you know, we are remote viewers and we work with, our, with the potential of our consciousness every day. So I would like to put that mystery into the middle, into the center of our discussion today, um, the consciousness. So maybe let's start with the easiest and simplest question of all. Tom, what is consciousness? Consciousness, and I have a, a very short definition of consciousness, and many people have very long definitions and very uh, complex definitions of consciousness, but it's simply awareness with a choice. Okay, awareness with a choice. Now, when you give awareness a choice, there's a couple of logical things that come along with that. One time comes with that because there's before the choice and after the choice. So you have time. And because you have a choice, then you also have free will because without free will, there is no choice. Everything is already done. You know, there are no choices at all. So when you say it's awareness with a choice, we have time, we have free will, we have consciousness all uh, you know, kind of come together. And those things are logically necessary for each other. You can't have consciousness without time. You can't have it without free will. So you can't have free will without consciousness and time. You know, so all three of those are logically dependent on each other. And philosophically, the opposite of that is physicalism, or many people say materialism. And that, if you are a materialist or a physicalist, you also have to be a determinist and if you're a determinist then you come to the you come to the uh, conclusion that there is no such thing as consciousness there's no such thing as time and there's no such thing as free will all of those things a materialist would say are are uh, imaginary they don't actually exist whereas if you are in my corner which says that uh, you have consciousness free will and time, then you would say that uh, deterministic things don't exist. Materialism doesn't really exist. It just appears to be materialistic, but the materialistic, the physicalist world really is an illusion. You know, and uh, of course, I had one very famous person agree with me, and that would be the Buddha. <laughs> he also said that the outside world uh, you know, is an illusion. So uh, that puts me philosophically in the group. Uh, let's see, called idealists. That's the kind of a group in philosophy, idealism, as opposed to the physicalists. Back a long time ago, they were called realists, but that definition kind of changed to mean something else. So, so now they uh, are uh, basically physicalists, which means they think that all of reality is made of matter. It's all, you know, what we call The, the physical matter universe is all there is. You know, there there isn't anything else other than that. That is fundamental, really, the nature of reality. 
And in my model, consciousness is the fundamental thing. It's all else is derived from consciousness, including physics and the reality that uh, people think is is physical. All that's derived from consciousness. And in my model, I, I show that scientifically or logically. Mm-hmm. Um, you say that consciousness is awareness and and a free will, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Where do you see, um, uh, how to say, the, the quality of, of experience um, within that that uh, definition of consciousness? I mean, when I experience something, I, I have a quality of feeling about it. I, I sense a quality, how much I like it, if I don't like it, and so on. Mm-hmm. That's, wait, part wait, of the I, aware, that's part of the awareness. So you're aware of things. And what are you aware of? Well, you're aware of things that, uh, well, in the state you're in, in this physical reality, in this physical body, you know, from that viewpoint, then you're only aware of things that uh, you bring in through your senses. You're, you're only aware of what's your sense data. So you, you take in information through your senses, and that uh, is what you are aware of. And that's what you like or dislike or like the smell of it or don't like the smell of it or whatever else. You know, that all those qualia are are uh, judgments and attitudes that you develop from your first experiences. You decide whether you like something or don't like something or it tastes good or it doesn't taste good or, or so on from your interaction with it. You come, you know, you have choices. So if you decide that you don't like it, it's maybe sour or prickly or something that uh, you don't like, then you form an opinion. That opinion is part of your memory. So when you see it again, you immediately are kind of negative toward it because last time you experienced it, it was not pleasant. So that's so experience is born out of your awareness of things, and awareness is born out of your is limited in this avatar that you're in now as Timo is limited to your sense data. That's all you're aware of. It's just your sense data, but you are consciousness. And as consciousness, you can be aware of a lot more than the sense data here in this reality, which is where your remote viewing comes from. There's other things you can be aware of. And you realize that this physical reality is just a subset of a much larger reality a more fundamental reality. So that's why the paranormal things are, are possible. If, if this reality was nothing but the physical, then there would be no paranormal things. There'd be no healing. There'd be no you know, remote viewing or cog- precognitive dreams or any of the rest, you know, mind-to-mind communication. All of that sort of thing would be impossible. But it's, it's very possible because the larger reality of which the physical reality is just one small subset is a much larger thing. And there, you know, we work under a different rule set. In the physical reality, there is a a rule set. Like all virtual realities, there's a rule set that defines that virtual reality. If you play the game The Sims, there's a rule set that defines what a Sim character can do and how they have to do it. You know, if they walk over to the refrigerator to get a beer, then there's, there's, you know, they have buttons to push that says walk and directions that they can turn in. And when they get there, they can raise a hand, which then will immediately make the refrigerator door pop open or something like that. Those are the rules. And that rule set defines what can and cannot be done in that sim's reality. And we also have a rule set in this virtual reality we call the physical universe. and that science's job is to find the rules. That's what scientists do. They try to dig out the rules. You know, F equals M A. You know, that's one of the rules. You know, there's you know, gravity is a is is part of the rule set. So we have we have rules. And this physical reality, which I call a, a virtual reality, is just information based. And most I shouldn't say well, I'll put it this way, most physicists that deal with particles 
you know, atomic physicists, particle physicists. Uh, there's a kind of a whole range of that. Even astrophysicists kind of mostly deal with particles, even though they're dealing in, with big things. Uh, most of them will tell you that that reality is information based, because that's what the experiments tell them. For instance, if they make the assumption that an electron is a little chunk of mass with a charge. Well, if that's their assumption, they can't get the right answer. You know, that doesn't work. They assume that an electron is a point with the attributes of mass and the attributes of charge. That does work. They can put that in their equations and they can get accurate, you know, uh, calculations about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So because of that, most of those sort of particle physicists are aware that our reality is information-based, not really math-based, and that if you make assumptions that things are physical, you can't get the right answer because they're not really physical. And in the in the quantum physics, um, you know, what a hundred years ago now, a hundred plus a few years ago, we had the double slit experiment, you know, with uh, you know Heisenberg and and uh, the rest of that that uh, that crew that in really invented quantum physics, and you know they came to the conclusion that consciousness was somehow involved, and most of them said that. If you go back and and look at the statements that those guys made, they very much said, you know, consciousness is fundamental here, and that's because they realized with the double slit experiment that. Our reality is only probabilistic. It's not deterministic. It's not actually even physical. Reality is probabilistic. And until a measurement is made, and it requires a consciousness to make a measurement, until a measurement is made, particles are not particles. They're just probability distributions. Then when you make the measurement, you get a particle. And they make up silly stuff like, you know, there's a, you know, the wave function collapses to a physical particle. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Wave function is a mathematical entity. You know, mathematical entities don't collapse into physical particles. You know, that's a ridiculous thing to say. But they don't know what else to say, so they say things like that because that kind of is a metaphor. It's not an actual thing that happens. Mathematics doesn't turn into physical particles. <laughs> that does, doesn't compute. But uh, the fact that reality is probabilistic is clear from the very nature of quantum physics. And, you know, that's why those, I don't know if you're familiar with the double slit, but basically the amazing thing that happened was that they send one particle at a time toward double slits, and those particles rearrange themselves on the screen behind the slits in an interference pattern. But they're one particle at a time. There's nothing to interfere with. There's no forces on them that would make them move to different positions. And we know that particles travel in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. You know, that's one of Newton's laws. So it's it's not explainable from a physical viewpoint. If you're a physicalist, that double slit experiment is magic. You know, there is no physical explanation for it. So, yeah. of course, they don't call it, the physicists don't call it magic. <laughs> they call it weird science. But if you understand that the nature of this virtual reality we call physical is probabilistic. It's a, probab it's a probability model, not a deterministic model. It's it's not from the grounds up. Tiny particles make bigger particles, make bigger bigger particles. You know, make uh, molecules, make the you know the outside physical world. It's not from the bottom up at all. It's a probability and statistical model. And the way one in this model determines what happens next, you know, is a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. Okay. If you had a deterministic model, then you know what will happen next. 
it's you've got all the state vectors of all the particles in the system, then you can tell what they're going to do next. So that's why it's a deterministic model. But in a probability model, there's no way to determine what's going to happen next unless you use probability. So you look at all the possibilities, the probability of each one of those possibilities, and from those probability distributions, you take a random draw, and that's what happens next. So that's the way the world works, and that's really what's going on with this, the wave function collapses to a physical particle. That's, like I say, that's a metaphor, and you know, if you take it literally, it's nonsensical. But what happens is that when the measurement is made, that random draw is taken from that probability distribution of the possibilities, and that's what happens next. So we take one, you know, the, the, the probability distribution looks just like the, uh, you know, the, the, what the optics gave us as an interference distribution. And the reason for that is if the system didn't give us that distribution for those particles one at a time, then there would be a logical contradiction between quantum physics and optics. Because optics with the waves and their wave theories had already seen that if you shine a coherent light against the slits, you'll get an interference pattern. And they can compute, you know, where the dips are, where the bright parts are, where the dull parts are, and so on. And the th the thing is that that photons, particles of light, photons are non-interactive with each other. They're all totally, completely independent. So it doesn't matter whether you put one photon through a slit, or if you put a million photons through the slit. They're non-interactive. You have to get the same result because they don't interact with each other. So if they're non-interactive, then whether you have lots of them or, or just one of them, it doesn't make any difference. So we know that if you put millions of them through, like in a in a uh, uh, an old Michelson Morley you know experiment, you know a, a shine a coherent light on the two slits. If you if you do that, then you get a wave pattern. Well, they're non-interactive, so when you threw, send them through one at a time, they have to make a wave pattern. And it has nothing to do with physical reality, the, the, the particles having a force pushing them around. It has to do with a random draw from a probability distribution. And that, that random draw from that probability distribution, well, one at a time, place them somewhere on that screen. And after you have enough of them to see what the picture looks like, you'll see an interference pattern. That way, there's no logical inconsistency between quantum physics and, you know, regular optics. So, mm -hmm. so anyhow, that's, that's kind of a very obvious reason why it's the correct thing to say that our reality is information based and it's not physical based because science <laughs> like i say you think an electron is a part you know particle with a charge you cannot get the right answer so our own physics tells us that this is true that that physicalism is wrong and that consciousness is indeed evolved how else do you make random choices from probability distributions if you don't have an awareness to do that, you know, that's a function that requires intelligence and, and uh, you know, reason has to understand the system. So it's pretty clear from, from physics itself that consciousness is fundamental, that our physical universe is a virtual reality computed in consciousness. Now, the, to get to remote viewing, since that's what you're interested in, the system has to know, has to have a database, has to have easy and quick access to all of the possibilities and their probabilities, because it's doing that all the time. Every time somebody digs a hole in the ground, you know, well, what's going to be there? It needs to take that random draw. Every time a measurement's made, every time somebody looks at something that's 
new that hasn't been looked at before, that, that has to be done. So that happens so often that it needs this database in order to work with. So it does that. It looks at the state of everything now in this virtual reality. And since it's computing it all, it knows exactly what that state is because it's computing the whole thing. And then it says, well, you know, give present trends and so on. And we'll, we'll guess that here's what's going to happen next. And if that happens, then here's what would happen after that and so on. So it can build this database of, of possibilities and with probabilities of those possibilities. And it does that just because it has data on us for millennia. You know, it understands it understands us and how we work and individuals and how they work and so on because it's doing the computation. Our body here is an avatar. We are a piece of consciousness playing that avatar. Okay, so that's the way it works. So if the whole game is being computed then obviously the the server that computes the game is well aware of all the details in the game because it's computing all the details in the game. So with that, it can make this uh, what I call the the uh, probable future database. Now this future is not is not a done deal. It's not like that will be the future. It's just probable, and there's a whole lot of probabilities. If if you know. If Harry does this, then George will probably do that. And if George does that, then Sally will probably do this. But they're all probabilities. You know, George may not do that. You know, and then you'd have to do some recalculation. But meanwhile, everything is in this database in terms of probability. Even the probabilities that are, say, one in a million. If, if George does this one in a million things, then Susie's liable to do this thing. And they're all basically made from taking random draws and looking at the, the, you know, the probability of possibilities. Okay. Now, that database is what the uh, Hindus call the Akashic Records. Mm -hmm. It's a big database, and it's got the future probable database in it. And as time goes on, what was in the future becomes in the past. So eventually, you also have this huge past database also that is everything that could have happened and the probability that it would have happened. And through that past database, there's a thread of, of events that did happen. The choice is that that's our history, is that thread through that database. But there's a lot of more possibilities there than what did happen. <coughs> so that's now where remote viewing comes from. A remote viewer is collecting data from that database. That database had to be put together so that the system could, you know, the rendering engine could render the virtual reality. Database was necessary. So that's, <coughs> excuse me, I'll try to get a licensure here and stop coughing. <coughs> so that, in a nutshell, is how remote viewing is accomplished. You are a piece of consciousness. As a piece of consciousness, you have access to that database. Now, you have your access is limited <coughs> to your intuitive processing. You as a human being can process information in two ways. You as a piece of consciousness, <coughs> okay, I really should have said that. You as a piece of consciousness, the human being is just your avatar. You are the consciousness. That means you're the player of the avatar. You make all the choices for the avatar. So every choice is your choice. The avatar just basically does whatever you choose for it to do. So anyway, uh, you as consciousness can process in, in two ways. One is intellectually, logically, okay? And the other is intuitively. All paranormal things take place through the intuitive channel. So if you think you're going to take your logic and rational channel in and do remote viewing with it, it doesn't work that way. You can't get there. <laughs> you just can't get there with that process. Matter of fact, you will find that most people in our culture are very left brain dominant. That means their, their intellectual and rational side dominates their intuitive side. 
most of them don't even know they have an intuitive side. <laughs> and the scientists would claim intuitive side doesn't even exist, you know. But that means that their intellectual side is very dominant. And, and uh, when they try to activate their intuitive side, that intellectual side comes in and, and wants to take over, wants to be the boss. Something happens and the intellect says, oh, what was that? Oh, I saw a red dot. Must be an apple. You know, it, the intellect comes in, tries to take charge, tries to guess what it is, tries to, you know, uh, just tries to take charge, you know, dominate. And if your intuitive side is weak, then it kind of shrinks away from that dominant intellectual side. And that's why most people find it very difficult to remote view or go out of body or heal with their minds, or might have mind-to-mind -mind communications, or, you know, go explore the larger system, you know, and meet entities and go places and do things. And, you know, they can't do that because their intellectual side constantly butts in and wants to take charge of the process. But the process has to be intuitive has to be on the intuitive side of processing. It's not a logical process. And you can't force it to be a logical process. You don't go out and grab the data. You go out and open up and let the data come to you. It comes to you. You query the database with an intent. You have to have an intention. And the more precise your intention is, the more accurate the data you'll get. The more free your intent is of that intellect and that logic, the better the data you'll get, the more power or more, I don't know, oomph, the more uh, attention you put on it, the better the data you will get. And if you have trained your, your mind to have discipline, so your mind's not jumping around all the time. Most people think you know, I don't know, 10 different thoughts all in, you know, a few seconds. Their mind's flipping from here to here to here to here to here. And that's why we learn to meditate. Meditation is simply a thing we do to discipline the mind so that we can have our mind sitting still, being quiet and being open so that it can receive this data and not confuse it with something else and not have the intellect come in and try to try to rearrange it or make sense out of it or that sort of thing. So that's kind of the mechanism of remote viewing. Now, remote viewers at first thought, well, they could only go places like around the earth. They could only see what was happening, say, on the other side of the planet. They were earthbound. And then they realized that that really wasn't true. <laughs> there was no boundary there. Then they realized they could go remote view in other places, you know the dark side of the moon or, you know, any place else they wanted to. And then they realized that it wasn't necessarily a place. It could also be a mind. It also could be some other, some other, you know, source of information. And eventually I think they got the idea that he could also go backwards in time. Well, that's just getting data out of that historical database. It's sitting there too. And you can wander around through all the possibilities and their probabilities in that database, which was very confusing because if you don't realize that there's a database, that the database is all of the possibilities and their connection through probability, then you can wander off on some probable future or some probable past that is 10 to the minus 20 of ever happening. But you don't know that, you know, as far as you're concerned, well, you followed the rabbit hole and that's where it went. But it may be that that was indeed a possibility, but a very small one. Mm. See, so your intention has to have also with it an intent that you are going to stay, say, on our history line. Or, you know, something like that. Otherwise, if you just go to the database, well, you could be looking at things that are just probability and. Never, never happened. Probably never will happen anywhere because they're they're improbable. 
So there's a lot of things that you have to be aware of. And if you're aware of these things, it makes your remote viewing better. So remote viewing is learned by practicing one discipline of the mind. So your mind isn't constantly running around with a whole bunch of thoughts in it. You can have just one thought, which is what it is your remote viewing and nothing else interferes with that. And it can be a lot better if you understand the nature of remote viewing. Um, also to understand that the database is very fast. It makes, it makes, uh, you know, asking Google seem really, uh, old and slow. You know, when you ask this database in consciousness, speed of consciousness is much greater than the speed that things take place with here in this virtual reality. So when you ask before the last thought even leaves your mind, the answer is already coming in. You know, it, yeah, it, and a lot of people get tripped up on that because they said, okay, here's my question now. Okay, I'm waiting for the answer. Well, the answer already was delivered and you missed it. <laughs> you know, as you were getting ready for the answer, the answer went right, right by you because instead of being open to the answer, you were trying to prepare yourself to get an answer. You know, so you have to stop all the expectation of process and you have to just let it happen. And those, those answers come instantly because it's a very fast processor compared to what we're used to. And you can use tools to slow it down. You can say, all right, I don't want the answer until I say now. And then you can say, all right, I'm ready now. And you'll get the answer. So if you want to slow it down, you can kind of program it with your intent in that way. But if you don't know to do that and you're not ready immediately which most remote viewers just learn to be ready immediately and they know the very first thing that pops into the mind that's it and and they don't uh, mess with that because if if you let the intellect get hold of it it'll just screw it up so they just take that and and have to work with whatever it was you know it uh, doesn't have to make sense it's just what you get and you build on it and like any good query engine and any database it, you usually have to ask a lot of questions before you isolate what you want. You know, there's very few times you go into Google and say, you know, I want to find this fact. And you just say, Google, give me the fact. And Google comes out and gives you that fact. That hardly ever happens. Usually you get something that is sort of what you want, but not quite. So you refine your query a little bit. And then and that's not quite right. So you change a couple of words in your query. And then you try it again. And on about your seventh or eighth try, you get what you want. But it's not necessarily a process of just, you know, getting what you want with one, you know, with one request. So you have to work on it. And remote viewing is the same way. If you're remote viewing something very simple, like what's in the box, what color is what's in the box, you know, then that's pretty simple. You just get that. But if you really want to know more about it than, say, just its color, then you have to ask it a lot more questions. And you have to, you know, keep working at the process until you fill enough in that, uh, uh, you know, you feel like you've captured the essence of whatever it is. And you usually know that. Matter of fact, you usually know when you're getting the right answer. And you know when you're getting the wrong answer. When you get something and you just don't feel right, you say, no, nah, that's not it. I got to do that again. Of course, you can always do it again. You can make as many queries as you like. From different angles and different you know perspectives and so that you can get a, a better sense of the answer you get and another thing about remote viewing that people don't realize is that you can remote view in real time what you're remote viewing is what's in the database about you know what has happened you can re you can remote view into the probable future database also about what's going to happen but it's just probable it might not happen and you can look at the probabilities. And actually, you can use your intent to modify those probabilities. That's how you heal. You can modify those probabilities with your intent. So you can look in that, you know, you can look into the database, let's say the historical database. But the historical database is only about 10 to the minus 44 seconds away from, from, from now. You know, now is a point at t equals zero, right? And so it's pretty close to being 
up to date. It's about as up to date as you can get because that data that data is computed. You know, often there's a delta t that computes that data, mm-hmm. so you you can do it real time. But when I say historical database, that historical database takes place immediately after now, so it's very close to being the current thing. So people, I've watched children, uh, both with big masks on, that uh, completely covered their, you know, it's one of those big masks that goes from here to here and wraps all the way around. (laughs) They had these big (coughs) opaque masks on, and they were playing air hockey game. Mm -hmm. One at each end of an air hockey table, and they were just remote viewing in real time. And if you've ever played air hockey, you know that is a game that is very fast. That puck goes from one end of the table to the other in fractions of seconds. It's not a game where, you know, you have much time to react. And that's most of the failures in that game is, is inability to have quick enough reflexes. You know, you have to have very quick reflexes to be good at that game because the action is so fast. And here are these two kids, both with blinded you know with with masks mm-hmm. on cannot see and they're they're playing air hockey and they're playing it successfully they're not just swatting and missing they're they're playing a very a very good active game of air hockey so you can learn to remote view in real time yeah I, it, i've seen those kids with these masks um, um riding a bicycle mm-hmm. um That's that's really incredible to see. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I have this mask here because there are seminars that you can visit here in Germany. And this mm-hmm. mask, um, y- you can't see through it. It's really thick. It's really black when you have it. But but these children can't see. You're totally right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. They, can, uh, they can read a book. You can mm-hmm. hold a book up to them. And, and you can bring your own book. You know, and you can, you know, so it's not like they memorize, you know, all the books in the universe. You know, they, uh, they're usually like six, seven years old, eight years old. You can bring your own book and and open it up, and as long as it's at their level that they can read, you know they'll just read it to you. And some of the the more the little older ones who are very bright, they also realize that they can they not only can read a book with this blindfold on, but they can tell what's going on in the next room. And they can read that book just as well in a partic- in a totally black, you know, a room where all the doors are shut and all the lights are off and there is no light. They can read the book just as well. And they can tell what's going on in, in next door and on the other side of the world. <laughs> so it's not just that they can see what's in front of them without their eyes. They can see what's going on anywhere they want to without their eyes. They're just remote viewing. Yeah, but most of the time that's not advertised because that frightens people. What my six-year-old can see what's going on in the bedroom at midnight? You know, oh, that's a little scary. You see, so they uh, that is not advertised. But and most of the kids are too young to really go there. If you don't point something out to them, they're not all that creative to come up with new uses. They just do what they're asked to do. Uh, it's only the ones that are a little older. But kids are easy to teach this. I asked the lady who does the teaching, and uh, she said that if they're like five, six years old, she can teach them in a day. Mm-hmm. If they are, you know, 25 years old, it takes at least a week, maybe two or three weeks, you know, before you can teach them because you have all these beliefs. And the beliefs uh filter out you know, the information you need because your belief is it's impossible so you, you it uh, is a problem overcoming your beliefs when you're that young you don't have you haven't developed yet these beliefs the whole world is kind of magic and anything could happen and you know weird stuff happens all the time when you're six years old And very little of it do you have any sense about or do you have any explanations for? And you're not really interested in explanations. You're just interested in experience. And with that kind of an attitude, it's not that hard to learn. But the more you grow up and realize that, you know, believe what, you know, what people tell you, 
then you find that all sorts of things are impossible, and then it becomes much harder to do. So True. <laughs> that's, uh, so that's kind of a general, you know, over the, kind of fly over the world of remote viewing as to, you know, why it works, where the data comes from, why the data is there, and why is it available, uh, that you can go into the future, you know, the probable future, you can go into the past databases, you can, uh, um, you can re re remote view in real time, which is a really handy thing if you're blind. And that some blind people have been taught to do that. And it's funny because they, you know, they have these beliefs, particularly if they weren't born blind, they have these, they have these beliefs about the way the world has to work. And most of us buy into the physicalist's viewpoint because it's just part of our culture. You know, nobody tells us to, to believe that, but we just do because it's part of our culture. So there was a, a fellow who was blind and had been blind for many years and was taught to, to uh, basically read, you know, by remote viewing, you know, read, with, read without using his eyes, read just with his mind. And he came into the class, and somebody went in the back and picked up this children's book and handed it to him and say, here, you know, read this to us. Just demonstrate that he could do this. Well, he opened the book, and he put his hand on the pages, and he'd run his fingers down over the page. And then he'd say, oh, this is a picture of a giraffe, and it's standing up, and there's a, a balloon that's on the right side, and, you know, and a child down on the other side. And so he described everything on the page, and he turned the book around, and we could see that that's what was on the page. And uh, interesting, when the, when the blind man came into the room, before we asked him to read the book, when he came into the room, he walked straight to the coat rack, took off his hat, hung it on. <laughs> Hung it on a hook, you know, and whatever. And, uh, you know, so obviously he not only had been there before because this was the place where he learned how to, to do this, but he obviously could do these things. But when asked, well, how do you do that? He says, oh, I see it with my fingers. When I rub my fingers over it, I see it. I can see the giraffe. I can see the colors. I see the balloon. I see the children. I see that through my hands. And uh, he says, well, it's just, and, and they kind of ask us, you know, well, what about your, what is it with your hands? And he says, well, I don't know how it works, but I know that when I touch things, I get the image. I can see the image that I'm touching. So I have to run my hand over it. I can't see it. Well, in his mind, that's just a belief. You don't have to touch things with your hands. Yeah. You know, this was a belief of him. But in order for him to get over the impossibility of what he was doing was just seeing things without his eyes, he had to create this tool, which was he had to touch it. Of course, he'd been blind for a long time, so he, all, he was familiar with the touch. You know, he did Braille, and he had, he had had to work in a, in a world of, of Braille where you touch things and touch things in his environment and touch people's faces. So he was used to that kind of fingertip thing. So he makes up this, this story for himself. That says, oh, the way this works is that when I touch it with my hands, I, I get this information. Not, you know, not true, but it works for him. Because if otherwise, if she said, no, you can't touch it, keep your hands in your pockets, then he'd say, I can't do it. You see, it's just a belief. He believes mm -hmm. he can't do it. So we have, we come up with these beliefs. And when we are just learning, the hard part is, there's something in you that says, this is impossible. I can't do this. I can't remote view. You know, I can't you know, see without my eyes. It's just impossible. And because you believe that, that becomes true. It is impossible for you. You have to get past the stage of, of uh, blocking it with your beliefs. Because we have mechanisms in our mind that allow us to sort and judge data. We get so much data coming from us. You know, all five senses are on all the time. And we have just tons of this data coming. And we have to make judgments about, is this useful? Is this critical? Should I pay attention to this or that? You know, and we have 
all these choices that help us deal with the large amounts of data we get. Now that we have computers and screens and the data, you know, just went up by probably a factor of 100 that we get in a day. So we have all these tools we use to sort and judge and sift that data to find out the things that are that are important to us. And when we have a belief that something can't be true, then we can't see it. That in our data sifting, that's just it. Skip that. It's not true. Don't even bother looking at, at those things. So that's how we create these filters that that get in our way. And then we make up a story. Oh, well, of course, I can't just get it from nowhere, but I can get it through my fingers. Ah, now that's something I can believe. Therefore, that's a tool that you make up. And people make up all sorts of tools. Remote viewers make up a lot of tools, tools that they use. And all these tools do is basically help the mind focus on what it is it's doing and get rid of the stuff that's blocking it. That's what the tools do. The tools themselves are really you know, not relevant. They're just there to help the user of the tool get around his own blocks, his own problems, his own beliefs, his own need to make it make sense. People don't like things that they don't understand, so they tend to make up make up reasons of why those things are like that. You know, that's why physicists say silly things like the wave function collapses to a physical particle. They don't like the uncertainty of just saying, well, the physical particle just appears there. I don't know where it just appears there. You know, and this probability wave gives us some idea of the probability of it appearing there. That's just too esoteric, too far out for people to think that thought. It's much easier to think something, even if it's ridiculous, that this piece of math causes a particle, you know, to appear here. Well, well that's pretty that's pretty goofy as well, but for some reason that's less goofy than thinking that it just does it because it does it. So we make up these stories, we make up these tools and and the the problem is is it, well, there wouldn't be a problem if you didn't really believe that the tool was fundamental. If you know it's just a tool and it helps you do things with your mind, that's fine. And as you grow, you'll find some tools are clunky and take time, and you discard those and you make new tools. But if you fall into the category where you believe that the tools are fundamental and they're real and they're necessary, and anybody who does this has to use these tools, otherwise they won't be able to do it. Because the only way you can really read a book like that is with your fingertips. You know, and you to make the tool into something that's fundamental, then that's a trap. Now you're locked into that belief. And all beliefs are limiting. So mm-hmm. where you want to go is not have beliefs. Be open to everything and anything. Anything's possible. And it's- open up those filters. You know, but you still have to have some filters, otherwise you get overwhelmed with data. So it's yeah. a, that's why it's so hard to learn to remote view. It's hard to learn to heal. It's hard to learn to, you know, get co- communications mind to mind. All these things are difficult just because we block the process. And to do these things, you don't have to learn anything new. All you have to do is to get rid of junk that's old. Get mm-hmm. rid of the junk that gets in the way. And there's, there's no new skill to be learned or there's no new anything really to be learned you just have to get rid of all the trash that that keeps it from happening and if you can do that if you can offload that then it's just as simple as anything your mind just needs a little piece of data and it goes down there it is you know everything kind of comes to you just as you need it even as you speak in conversations you know Ideas, concepts, information just appears in your mind as you need it. And that's the way it should be. So, all right. I'll, I'll be quiet for a while and let you, uh, let you take all that and, and make questions out of it because that is the overview of remote viewing from my big toe. And, and yeah. I couldn't have summarized it better than you did because 
anything you explained about remote viewing right now is exactly the way as we experience it. Uh, for instance, the probabilities when we work with uh, the probabilities of the future, um, we is um, explicitly ask for uh, the viewer to get the the largest probability. So uh, it's exactly what you what you describe. If we don't define that, we might end up in any probability. It might be totally unlikely. Yeah, right. and that's exactly it. Yeah, it seems to be a database. You're totally right. Yeah. Um, one question regarding the database. What what do you think? I mean, it's it seems to be a metaphor, right? The the database somehow. What what is it? Is it everything's a metaphor? I, I talk about the larger consciousness system. That's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for source. You know, and I, I talk about uh, individuated units of consciousness. That's what we are, you know, pieces of the larger consciousness. Very much like uh, you have a virtual, a virtual machine inside of a larger computer. I know you're, you're computer science, so that makes sense to you. You know, you, you have a virtual machine inside a bigger machine, and it's like that. So we're, individuated units of consciousness, but we're like virtual machines inside a bigger machine. So we're all part of the same thing. We're pieces of this larger conscious system, but we're independent, just like a virtual machine has its own independence in many ways. It can work on its own problems in its own time and in its own way, but it's still a part of the larger system. So that's the that's the meaning behind the we're all one. You know, yes, we are all one. We're all pieces of this this consciousness. I'm not sure where I was going with that, but uh, yeah, what, what the database is like what what it is made of. It's a metaphor. Metaphor, it was, yeah, that's where I was going with that. It's all metaphor. IOCs are metaphors. The database is a metaphor. You know that it's a virtual reality. You know, even that's a metaphor. But metaphors are things that you, you know, if you want to explain something particularly if it's something that other people aren't familiar with. You're going outside of their own personal experience. There's really no other way to do that other than in terms of metaphor. You have to speak in terms of metaphors that they understand so that they can get that metaphor and kind of understand something of what you're saying. There are no, there are no direct words in our language to describe these things we're talking about. Language developed in order to describe things inside the virtual reality. You know, here's a rock, here's a tree, you know, here's Uncle George. So all the all the words we have, all the concepts we have for language are created to help us more accurately describe our experience inside the virtual reality. So now we're talking about consciousness, and that's outside the virtual reality. We really don't have any way to directly talk about that. Okay? So we have to describe it with metaphors and a metaphor can be real rough you know like you know her eyes were as blue as the deep blue sea well that's a metaphor but it doesn't tell you much you know what sea at you know the sea at you know at what temperature you <laughs> know what time of the year you know and what is what does that mean well it doesn't mean anything it's not precise but it doesn't have to be precise it tells you you know, tells the the listener kind of what it is they they need they need to know. But some metaphors can be very precise, and I think making consciousness a information system is a real good metaphor because it that's the way it acts, that's the way it functions. You know, it uh, functions like an information system, and this reality functions like a virtual reality, a computed reality, computed by consciousness so those are all metaphors to describe what we i should say see but what we uh, can interact with you know i spent basically 40 years interacting in the non-physical in the larger consciousness system to try to understand how it worked and take all of those understandings and then I use the best metaphors I can <laughs> to explain them to other people. You know, it's that sort of thing. But <clears throat> this this computer science set of metaphors really are good metaphors 
They're not real wishy-washy like her eyes are as blue as the deep blue sea. They're pretty precise. <laughs> that is exactly how consciousness works. It works like a computer, mm -hmm. <laughs> like an information system. And the fact that information systems evolve by creating information. And, you know, well, aware, conscious information systems evolve by creating information. And then that falls right into the idea of what is, you know, what's the purpose? Well, the purpose is to create better, more interesting, more valuable information. That's how an information system evolves. And then that makes a lot of sense. That gives consciousness a purpose. And then you get all the IUOCs and the consciousness system together, you have a social system. And when you have a social system, what's the best way that a large number of individuated units of consciousness can lower their entropy? Well, it's if they cooperate and if they care about each other and if they help each other, it's much better than if they dislike each other and are afraid of each other and don't trust each other, then they can't really be very helpful to each other. It's all very self-centered, all about me kind of thing. So it's obvious that in our social system of consciousness, you know, where we got, you know, what now, about 9 billion people, you know, that's a heck of a social system we got there. And in, within a social system, the way you lower entropy, which is the fundamental purpose of consciousness, is through caring, sharing, helping. How can, you know, how can I help? Not what's in it for me. You know, that uh, that then defines ethics, defines morality, defines right versus wrong. If it, in the long term, lowers entropy for both the individual and the system, then that's right. And if it increases entropy in the system, then that's wrong. So it, it gives you a, a, a real precise guide of morality and ethics, right and wrong, all that falls out of it. And the more you investigate that, the more it just fits like a glove. That's why I say it's a really good metaphor, because all of the logical consequences of the metaphor fit like a glove. They just describe things and explain things that now are unexplainable. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, philosophers have tried for a long time to do what they call a uh, um, was it a um, it's basically a, a set of logic that would do that that could always tell you what was right or wrong? I think uh, a moral code that's what it was called, and you know, define a moral code. And Spinoza was one of the last ones to do that, and he did a pretty good job. But the problem was the moral codes that all these philosophers came up with they always had holes in them, there was always some set of circumstances that it didn't apply to. Mm -hmm. where it was wrong. And that's because they were looking at morality in terms of actions. What do you do? What happened? But morality is not tied to actions. It's tied to intent. Why did you do it? You know, that's, that's where the morality is tied. And that's just tied to mind. That's not, that's not tied to the physical world, you know, the action in the physical world. So that, uh, now, I could go deeper into that logic if you wish, but that's the kind of thing. It, it, uh, you know, I have solved somewhere around 30 uh, paradoxes in the sciences. And so, you know, some in philosophy, some in mathematics, some in sociology and psychology, but mostly mm -hmm. in science. Paradoxes where people know that this is, this is how it is but we have no idea why it is that way. You know, simple paradoxes. Uh, things have been around, well, even the, the uh, double slit experiment is a paradox in, in physics. You know, where did that ball of plasma come from? It's a paradox, you know, in Big Bang Theory, you know, because our universe didn't exist yet. You know, it was something existed outside of our physical reality, which mm -hmm. conflicts with the idea that our physical reality is the only thing there is. You know, so there's a logical problem there with where did that ball of plasma come from that uh, made the Big Bang? And how did it get there? And who put it there? And, you know, what's, the, what's its origin? And, of course, there's no answers for things like that. But the MBT theory gives answers to all those things, you know. 
why what's called the uh, uh, there's a set of constants in physics I think there's like five constants that are they're called you know cosmic constants and all five of them are, are tuned to each other they're all if you if you changed any one of them in the eighth decimal place the whole universe would become unstable you know gravity is one of those you know so how did these five constants become tuned to eight decimal places? If the world, like the materialists would say, actually has to be, everything has to be random. You don't have five constants that tune themselves to, you know, to eight decimal places as a random event. You know, that doesn't happen. That's, that's one, you know, times 10 to the minus, you know, 100,000 or something ridiculous that, that, uh, that would just happen by random events. So. There's lots of mysteries like that in in uh, science, even even basic things like physics is basically you gotta have a handful of basic things: time, space, mass, spin. I don't know. There's probably a couple of other ones I've missed. Uh, but anyway, you have some just basic things, and everything else is how these things interact with each other. You know. Time, space, mass, all of, all of Newton's theories all come out of just time, space, and mass. And anyhow, you ask a physicist, where does time come from? Where does mass come from? Where does, you know, where does charge, that was another one, where does charge come from? And they have no idea. But that's the basics for all the physics. So I'm always amused by that fact that you have a bunch of physicists who are materialists and the very foundation of their science is woo-woo. <laughs> the very basic of their science is magical. They just popped out of nowhere. They just are there because they're there. You know, and uh, that's the that's the basement. That's the foundation of physics. It's just it's there because it's there. So that that tells you something. It tells you that our our knowledge is missing something, that our perspective is wrong, that we just need to look at reality from a different viewpoint that makes more sense, because there's so many things that don't make sense from the materialist viewpoint. That it just doesn't compute. Like, you know, the idea that if your doctor tells you this pill is a really great pill and wonderful, you know, it will let more likely help you. A placebo effect, you know, doesn't make any sense. It's just chemistry, isn't it? It's just biochemistry. If you swallow the pill, then the pill just does whatever the chemistry does, and something happens, and whether your doctor tells you something or not is irrelevant. Couldn't possibly have anything to do with it. But it, we know it does. Matter of fact, we know that with such certainty that if people can't pass the placebo test, you can't market the drug. So we take a piece of woo-woo that science says is silly and stupid, and it's hmm. part of our laws to determine whether whether drugs can be marketed or not. <laughs> so, you know, so in one hand, we we see that these things do happen. We admit that they do. We even admit that they're important and significant. But our science says they're impossible and therefore they don't exist. That is wrong. You know, that's not good science. That's mm -hmm. religion. And science is their their deep and abiding belief in materialism or physicalism is religious in nature it's not really based on any facts of any sort it's just belief there's nothing yeah. really that says that that true matter of fact the science says that that's not true but they refuse to take that as an answer Oh, I'm sure we'll we'll find some logical reason for it someday. You know, it's, I'm sure there'll be some good physical explanation for why that happens. But you know, a hundred years have gone by since quantum physics, you know, started, mm. and no no physical explanation has come out yet. N you know, nor will it because it's based on the fact that it's a virtual reality run on probability, and that's the nature of our reality. It's just the way it is. So let me yeah. be quiet for a while and give you a chance to ask some questions. <laughs> oh, you answered so many questions already. Um, 
you mentioned the concept of, of entropy that the larger system is, is trying to reduce the entropy. Uh, so you see the, the larger system actually in a kind of development process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is going to happen when the entropy reaches its minimum? Let's say a simple, simple case, the, the larger system comes to, to the conclusion that any information can be encoded within the number 42, just like <laughs> Douglas Adams wrote, right? <laughs> what, what's, what's next? <laughs> well, that point is not likely to, to occur. And here's why. The more you learn and the more you understand, the more possibilities there are. So the, this, this process of lowering your entropy doesn't kind of use up a finite number of possibilities. It creates new possibilities. So you're always creating more and more possibilities. You know, when you had just a larger consciousness system, you had a limited number of possibilities. And then you have an individual unit of consciousness, which also has free will, and their interaction creates a lot of new possibilities. And then you have, you know, 8 billion or 9 billion in, you know, individuated units of consciousness. And the possibilities are just tremendous. You know, there, there, there's so many. And as those, as those probabilities work out, and as those 9 billion IUOCs begin to work together, what they can accomplish is more than we can even imagine at this point. If, they all, you know, if we all cooperated and cared about each other, what we could accomplish would be you know, huge compared to what we accomplish now. You know, we're, like, we're like toddlers you know, playing in a daycare playpen. You know, now what can what can toddlers playing in a playpen accomplish? Well, mostly they grab toys that they want and you know and fuss fuss with each other about, you know, who can get the toy. So there's a there's a lot of dispute and a lot of crying and a lot of wailing and thrashing around and some giggles and you know, but that's kind of that's the world we live in. Well, if you once you grow up, there's so many more possibilities that, that can happen as you grow up. So the, the number of possibilities just keeps growing as we grow up. And it's the same with the system. When the system was just a monolithic thing, there's only so much that it could really think about. It was, it was trying to be creative, to come up with new ideas. But, you know, if you just sit by yourself thinking new ideas, that's hard. If you have three or four good friends that you can bounce new ideas off of, well, then stuff starts to loosen up and, you know, Somebody says something to trigger something to trigger something else. And that's a much richer space in which to be creative in. So the larger consciousness system is still evolving. Now, it's still growing and evolving and understanding. We people are like, like I say, we're like toddlers in a, in a big playpen in a daycare. And as we grow up, there'll be just so many more things that we will be able to accomplish together that we can accomplish, you know, fighting and squabbling and fussing with each other because we're so self-centered. So I think it just keeps getting bigger. And the more you know, the easier it is to know more. So I, I don't see it as a, a finite set of possibilities. I see it as an open set of possibilities that just keeps, keeps growing. So mm -hmm. there is no there is no end that you're gonna that you're going to get to. There's always going to be new things to learn, new challenges, new ways of of doing things. And if you think of evolution in general, evolution is like that. You know, here we are, we've evolved to whatever we've evolved to be right now in this virtual reality. Okay, so we evolve according to the rule set. But what are humans mm -hmm. gonna look like a million years from now? Who knows? You know? They probably won't look just like us because we didn't even exist a million years ago. Homo sapiens have just been wandering around for, you know, around 200,000 years. Well, that's an eye blink, you know, 200,000 years is not much at all. Where are we, what are we going to look like a million years from now? Well, it depends on what our environment's going to be like. You know, what is our environment? What are the stresses that we have to do? You know, 
how fast are we going to have to think? How much data are we going to have to process? Uh, how are we going to do that? You know, so there's so many possibilities that you never know what road of all those trillions of possibilities, what road are you going to take? You know, what, what road is humanity going to take? Well, everything has that sort of endless branching of possibilities. And the mm -hmm. more capable you get, the more possibilities there are. So it just keeps evolving. And, it, and the, the circumstances create stresses and pressures that we evolve, you know, in this virtual reality to meet those. So, you know, if suddenly something terrible happens and the atmosphere is not, is too hot to, you know, to exist there, then we'll probably dig holes, you know, and people will live, you know, in tunnels and they'll adapt to that. They'll get to where they're good at it and even comfortable in it. Who knows what will happen, you know, and what we'll go through. But, you know, if you think about all the possibilities, it's just kind of endless. And each one of those possibilities opens up new possibilities, closes down old ones, opens up new ones. That happens with every choice we make. So we have a choice, okay? I could marry Sally or I could marry Susan. If I make that choice, it affects Sally's life, it affects Susan's life, it affects mm -hmm. my life, it affects, the, it affects the lives of all of my closest associates and friends, it affects, you know, uh, Susie's closest associates and friends and all of their closest associates and friends. And this just because I make a choice, you know, it'll liable to have a ripple effect that'll affect hundreds of people. And if you happen to be a big mover and shaker in our world where where the choices affect billions of people. Well, yes, you know, so. The choices, every time you make a choice, even if you're just a little guy living in a small little hut someplace, you know, in the grasslands, it affects others. You make a mm. choice and it affects everybody around you. You know, it affects the environment around you. It affects everything. And as the environment changes, it affects you. And as you change, you affect it. So we have all of this interchange and interaction that basically is called evolution. And what evolution does is it explores all the possibilities. And as it explores all the possibilities, the ones that work well persist. The ones that don't work well fall by the wayside. And every time you get something that works well, you've just created a whole new, larger set of possibilities. So, you know, what was the possibilities that were in front of, you know, a, a Homo sapien 200,000 years ago? And what are the possibilities that are in front of you and me now? Oh, hugely different, you know, hugely different set of things that we could do or be or become. And, you know, you and I have had a choice of a hundred different careers we could have gotten into, you know, thousands of different things we could have done, different relationships, we could, you know, all like that. But, uh, you know, a, a homo sapien run around 200,000 years ago had only two interests, you know, survival, <laughs> procreation. You know, that was, that, was, that was the only two things going on at the time, and they were kind of all-consuming. But as we grow, the, the choices become more and more, and I call that choices, the, the, the volume of those choices or the number of those choices, decision space. So our decision space keeps growing. So evolution doesn't eat up available decision space. It keeps creating more and more decision space. So I don't think that we'll, we'll ever run out of things to do. And the thing about entropy is that if you don't keep putting energy in to lower in it, it tends to just naturally increase. Mm -hmm. if you don't somehow put energy in. You know, that's, that's why you have to plug a, a refrigerator in. You have to give it energy so that it can actually reduce the temperature, you know, which is lower entropy. You know, it can reduce the temperature in the refrigerator, but it won't do that unless you give it energy. Mm -hmm. And we work the same way. We lower the entropy of our consciousness, and we don't try to do that. If we don't try to make good choices, if we put no effort into it, the tendency is to make poor choices. And as you make those poor choices, it makes it easier to make more poor choices and so on. And you kind of take a, 
a slide downhill toward increasing entropy. So you never get to the point that you say, ah, I'm done. I finally graduated. I'm done. You're never done. Because as soon as you say, I'm done, I quit. I quit the game. I'm, I'm here. I'm as close to zero entropy as anybody can get. So I'm retired now. That's when you start de evolving and your entropy starts going up. So the point is, when you grow up, becoming love is about other, not about you. So this idea that I'm going to retire and it's going to be all about me, well, that's not a low entropy kind of thing to feel. So you have those, those uh, people, particularly in the Eastern, some of the Eastern religions, that they are going to reach enlightenment and then they're done. You know, they've, they've got out, off the wheel of time and, and they're whatever. You're never done. There's always some way to help. There's always something you can do of value, some way to be of use, some way to be of service. It's, uh, and it's what you want to do when you're more evolved. You don't want to be done. You want to be of use. You want to help. That's what, you're, that's what drives you. You're not driven to retirement. You're driven to, uh, to useful action, action that's helpful and valuable. That'll make a positive contribution to the whole. That's what you're driven to. That's what you want to do. That's where your happiness comes from. You know, that's where your satisfaction comes from. So this idea of I'm I graduated, I'm I'm enlightened, I'm done, I quit. Those are the those are the concepts of somebody who's a long way from being done, and uh, they they won't quit. And if they try to quit, they'll realize they start de evolving. Because they're no yeah. longer putting effort in the lowering entropy. So yeah. Um, so uh, what happens at the moment of death? Is there, is there a concept like reincarnation? Does it repeat? Do I get another chance to lower the entropy? Yes, indeed. Reincarnation is a real thing. I uh, was very surprised. <laughs> To find those sorts of things out, you know, I was a, I started this path in my early twenties, maybe even middle twenties, going out to, to, you know, to the to the lab with Bob Monroe. That was before there was a TMI, the Monroe Institute, or anything like that. That was, you know, years before any of that was ever thought of. But you now, let's see, where was I going with that? Oh yeah, reincarnation. Um, I was, if you'd have asked me what philosophy or religion or something, I would have been like the typical uh, physicist. I would have said, atheist, you know, God is not, you know, there isn't some little old man with a long white beard, you know, playing with these pet people. You know, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. And it was very surprising because the more I, I grew up and, and let go of that sort of arrogance, the the, the more obvious it was that many of the traditions, religious traditions around the world of all sorts, many of them had important parts of the truth. You know, the, the, they, they had a lot of other junk as well. They had a lot of stuff that was added that really wasn't helpful, but they did have some, some good ideas that that is the way the world works. And yes, reincarnation is one of those. It turns out that uh, That is the way it has to work. And the reason is to evolve, we have to change who we are. We have to have less fear and more love. You know, you can boil it down to love and fear. Love is the growth side. Fear is the de-evolutionary side. Love is the evolutionary side. So we're here to get rid of that fear, become love. Now, love means about other. That's where the caring, sharing You know, cooperation all comes from. It's about other, not about self. Fear is all about self. Self-centered. It's all about me. What's in it for me? You know, uh, if you have a relationship with somebody, it's only because you think they can do something for you or, or solve some of your needs or wants. You know, it's all very self-centered. And the self-centered stuff is high entropy. The love stuff is low entropy. So if If what you're here to do is grow up, that means change. Get rid of the fear. Become a lower entropy person. 
It doesn't have anything to do with your intellect. It doesn't mean act like a low entropy person. It means be a low entropy person. You know, it doesn't mean act kind. It means be kind. There's a big difference. You know, if you're acting, it's just your image. It's your intellect saying, this is the way I should be. It's not the same as being that way. When you are that way, you don't even notice that you are that way. It's just, <laughs> it's just the way you are. You know, it just comes natural. It's, it's, it's the way you feel. So to change to who you are is a difficult thing to do. And it takes a significant amount of personal work to do that. Growth is slow. Human beings have been here, I said, about 200,000 years. And look at us. We're still largely tied up in, you know, the, the uh, control power force, uh, you know, attitudes toward, toward life. You know, the warlord mentality, you know, whoever's got all the guns, you know, rules. You know, force, mm -hmm. force makes right. You know, might makes right. Yes, yeah, that's you know, you know, control power force is what everybody wants. Now, not everybody wants to overrun other people, but they still want control, power, and force. They want a good job. They want money because that gives them control and power and some force. So it's it's not always used in an evil way, but it's it's really the not a good set of things to to want and need. But it's the way our culture is. Our culture requires that of us. If we're going to do well in our culture, then we need to acquire some control, power, and force. Yeah, that's that's what being successful in our culture requires. Mm -hmm. You know, control means you can kind of do what you want. You have some control over your life. You are able to go places you want to go and do the things you want to do. And you know, power means that you can you can uh, what change bad situations into good situations. You can make things happen for yourself. You've got friends. You've got connections. You've got inside scoop. You play golf with the boss. You know, all of these are forms of power. You know? So. Anyhow, that's unfortunate. You know, that's very high entropy. So to learn to be different, not just act different, is a difficult thing. And it takes many lifetimes to do that. Most people have no idea that they're here to do that. They don't even know what their purpose is. So imagine how good you are at a game when you have no idea what the game is. Mm -hmm. You're not a very good player if you don't understand the game. You know, you just wander around clueless in the playing field and have, have no idea what the game is. So you can imagine that progress is very slow. So you need many lifetimes to, to continue the process. The system is consciousness, and you're a piece of consciousness. Time, there's plenty of time. Time just is, you know. Time is comes with, remember, the definition of consciousness. You know, it's awareness with a choice. Time's just a part of it. Now, the system can make regular time just by taking a, you know, a one and a zero and letting them oscillate. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Letting them oscillate. That's a metronome. You know, that makes, that makes time. So you can make regular time so that you can make sequences of things and understand what comes before and after and how much time before you change this much. And so there's, there's regular time, but besides regular time, there's just time as a, as a thing. It's just there. It comes in with consciousness. You can't have consciousness without a concept of time. You can't have choice without a concept of time. So, so time is just there for us to use. And if it takes us another 200,000 years, you know, to take another step forward, well, we'll use 2,000 years to do it. That's not a problem. The larger conscious system has a very long view. You know, it doesn't have, you know, we, we have a short view, you know. You know, ants have an even shorter view. <laughs> Fleas have an even shorter view. They only have like a two-week life cycle. Mm. You know, so they have a very short viewpoint. But... Uh, the larger conscious system has a very long viewpoint. It's not in a hurry. It, it uh, knows that 
real change takes a lot of time. So we have to have reincarnation. Otherwise, if you just get one shot, then we'll see how well you do. We'll see how much fear you get rid of in one shot, and that's it. What do you mean that's it? What do you do if that's it? What's, what's, what's next if that's it? Well, yeah. there isn't any next. The whole purpose and point of our existence is to lower our entropy. So what's next? Oh, you get back in the game and try it again. That's what's next. You know, and that keeps on being being next and there's no really end to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That uh, that's kind of the answer to, you know, what's the end game? There really is no end game. Evolution yeah. keeps going, making more and more choices. More and more ability, more and more you know, you gain more and more power. As you as you gain more love and less fear, you're a more powerful being. And I don't mean that you're good at paranormal things. You're just more powerful in the sense that, you know, people see you as positive. You're a positive person. You're a caring person. You're a loving person. People value your advice. They value just being around you, you know, hanging out with you. You become someone that that uh, other people will try to emulate. Well, that's power. So you become a more powerful being as you grow up and become love. Though in your own mind, your point and purpose is all about service and what can you do to help. So you may be a very powerful being, but you still may, you know, wash the feet of the guy standing next to you. So power isn't about how many other people you can push around. You know, that's Mm -hmm. control, power, force kind of power. Power I'm talking about is is the power of of being grown, the power of having a a, a larger decision space, understanding things, you know, better, understanding things more deeply. That gives you power. It gives you an ability to to see what's what's likely to happen next, and it gives you the ability to say the right things to somebody to help them grow up. It makes you more effective. So that just keeps growing. But if somebody wants to get there because they're on a power trip and they want more and more power, well, that's productive because their power they're thinking about is, you know, how many people can you manipulate? And the real power doesn't manipulate anyone. It helps other people change themselves. They don't go in and change other people. They just help other people change themselves. And, you know, we've had, if you think about who are the people that you would would recognize, that you know of, that had massive influences on the world, you know, not just on their neighborhood or just their, you know, their culture, but on the world. Well, if you think of those people that did that, all of them were that way because of their love and caring. It wasn't because they were big war heroes, and you know, it wasn't Genghis Khan because he uh, had a large empire, you know, or or Caesar or any of those guys. You know, they came and went. They were a big flash in a pan and were powerful for a while, and most of them got assassinated before they were very old. You know, they didn't even live very long. You know, so yeah, they were able to push a lot of people around, but that's not the power that really changes the world. The people that change the world are people like Gandhi. You know, people like that in that category who have changed the world. It's because of the good choices that they made, because of their attitude, because of the quality of their being. That's power. That's real power. That's a lot more power than ability to push people around. That's a that's a negative kind of power that lower that increases your entropy and makes you de evolve. So learning to develop your intuitive side is a good thing. It'll help you grow up, and as you grow up, it'll help you be kinder. Now, you can grow up and and become mean, (laughs) not kind, and uh, that's possible, but then it just means you evolve a while, and then you de-evolve a while. You know, you you grow and you, you sink. So that's also possible. 
that I'm sure happens. Um, you know, what do they say? Power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's not true. Those people who are really grown up, power does not corrupt them. But they're very few and far between. Most people have a lot of growing yet to do. And that part of them that is high entropy tends to misuse power. So that's sort of the, the big picture. So yes, uh, uh, I didn't put reincarnation in my model because I thought it was a cool idea and the Buddha liked it. <laughs> I, I put it there because it was absolutely a necessary logical part of the process of evolving. You can't evolve without having many options and many lifetimes. And the, the idea of a lifetime is that you don't take your intellect with you. All you take with you to the next life is the quality of consciousness you've learned up to that point. So that you're forced to make a whole set of new choices based on who you are inside and your quality. You can't game the system because you don't know what the game is. You just make choices that express your quality. And by those mm -hmm. choices, you evolve or de-evolve. That's the point. Whereas if you carried a lot of information with you, then you'd be constantly trying to game the system. Oh, I should be nice. I know that. You know, I, I should be a kind, nice person, so I'll act that way. Well, that won't help you evolve. Mm -hmm. Civilizing so to those around you, but it's not going to help you evolve. You have to stop acting and, and actually be kind. And here we have the reason why we don't remember the previous life, if I understand mm -hmm. correctly. That's one reason. It would, it would make a mess of things. One, you, if you had a lot of memory of the previous life, you would bring all of the baggage you had with you, all the beliefs, mm -hmm. all the prejudices, you know, all, the negative, all that negative junk that you're carrying around. You'd haul all that negative stuff into the next reality. So if you were a very, say, uh, biased person or prejudiced person or hateful person, then you'd bring that with you. And like I say, most of us are toddlers. So the, the majority of what we are tends to be high entropy. As we grow, that's kind of a small piece and we're trying to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. But why would you want to take, you know, the big piece that's negative with you? You want to leave that behind. So that's another reason why you don't want all that. And a third reason is that if you had all that information, it would be overwhelming. Uh, it would just be too much. Couldn't deal with it. You know, people say, oh, I want, I want to always be with my children, you know, my children and, you know, or my spouse or somebody. And, you know, I, I don't want to ever leave them. I want to be with them forever, forever. Well, you've already said that to probably 10,000 other people, you know, <laughs> and you've probably had 10 or 20,000 husbands or wives. You've probably had 30 or 40,000 children, all who were just the dearest to your heart. And, you know, how could you deal, you know, if you had the memory of all of that, how, you couldn't deal with that. Just your inner family, just husbands and wives and children. You couldn't even shake each one of them's hand once, you know, in a millennia. <laughs> much less actually have a conversation with them. There would be so many of them. So it just becomes unwieldy, and you don't need to bring that with you. What you need to do is have lots of different environments in which to make choices. Because if you have the same environment over and over and over, well, you tend to get in a rut. You'll tend to make similar choices. So you want the environment to be totally different, and you want it to be one that is unfamiliar, different. Now, you have to express yourself in that environment. All right, now then you express yourself. Some kid's got a toy and you'd like to have it. You go over and grab it and jerk it out of his hands. You know, that's, that's how you deal with that. Well, that's the level that most of us are at. You know, we have to teach our children. Now you need to share. <laughs> Give Tommy back the toy, you know. You need to share. You can ask him for it later. He just got it now. And, you know, we try to teach our children things like that. But uh, what we're doing mostly is teaching them rules, social rules that they need to obey to get along. 
And if they don't obey those, it makes their life much more difficult. People won't like them. So most people are pretty good actors when it comes to the, you know, being socialized, the social graces. But once the situation really deteriorates, where it's everybody for themselves, you see that that's a very thin veneer of, of uh, you know, gracefulness that uh, people have. When things get really rough, you know, it's everybody's grabbing whatever they can grab. And if they get a step on you to get out of that burning building, well, they'll just walk right over top of you and never think twice about it. You know, that's when things get tough, then people tend to revert back to who they really are. And uh, generally, that's not such a pretty sight. You know, who they really are is is very self-centered for the most part. And, uh, so we, it's hard to grow up. And it's harder yet if you have no idea that that's what you're supposed to be doing or, or, how, to, or how to do it. So I think we're going to start growing up much more quickly in the future because more and more people will understand what they're here for, what it's about. And as, as more people catch on to that, and now, you know, that doesn't have to just stay in a little bubble of enlightenment someplace. Now we have Internet, you know. Millions of people can share ideas, whereas before that never was a thing. That, that couldn't happen. So before you'd have the, you know, you have a Buddha who understood these things and said, oh, yeah, this reality is, he didn't say it was virtual. He said it was uh, um, non-physical. The real reality is behind this physical reality. You know, it's just an illusion, an illusion for us to make choices in and, and play in grow up in but it's it's not the real reality so he had that idea and of course he got a lot of followers and it grew over the ages but still it's in the margins ideas like that aren't mainstream and they're not mainstream because they're opinions they're not facts and we learn that only facts are valuable opinions you have to be careful with because it could be wrong could be right and there's really no way to know for sure so as long as their opinions, they stay in the in the uh, in the margins of society, and have some following, but it doesn't really affect the the mainstream culture. Hmm. But once you understand the way reality works, and that consciousness is the fundamental thing in reality, and so on, then these ideas of love is the answer are not opinions. They're facts, logical facts that can be logically derived from the nature of the reality that you're in. And that makes a whole, that makes a really big difference. Yes, religions have been trying to get people to turn the other cheek and act nice and be kind and do unto others as you would have them do unto you, et cetera, et cetera, but without much success because. Mm. Nobody takes it all that, I shouldn't say nobody, most people just don't take it all that seriously because it's an opinion and because it's difficult to impossible for them to do it because they're not grown up enough to act that way. So when that becomes known that that's the nature of our reality, it's the lower entropy which comes to become love, And if you're not working in that direction, you're de-evolving in the opposite direction, then I think more people will try and take Mm -hmm. growing up more seriously. And I think we'll have a whole lot more progress. No. Take some big steps. I think in the next couple of decades, we may see some some steps that that are really giant steps compared to what Homo sapien has been able to do so far in the first 200,000 years. The next, you know, like I say, next few decades could see us taking as as a as a race, as a human race, taking some major steps forward. Maybe we'll go all the way from uh, from uh, daycare all the way up to kindergarten. <laughs> it's a pretty mm-hmm. big step, you know. You know, going from you know three and four year olds up to five and six year olds. That's a big step. You know, we may we may do that. That would be yeah. a giant step. You know, it's, we started as daycare and we're still in daycare 200,000 years later. You know, that's not a lot of progress. But if you just look back 500 years, you'll see that we've progressed more in the last 500 years 
than we did in the, you know, almost 200,000 years before that. If you just go back 500 years, life was cheap. Anybody with control, power, and force could run right over people who didn't have that. Kill them, use them, abuse them any way they wanted. You know, it was the, the control, power, force ethic was, was very, you know, much stronger then than it is now. That's weakened quite a bit still around. And there are some places that are still run that way. But there's a whole lot of uh, people now in the world that, that are much better off than they were then. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, evolutionary process follow an exponential growth, maybe? It does. It, it accelerates. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, uh, you know, the, it has a curve. I don't know if I can do this a little bit. It starts out very, there's my fingertip. There it is. starts out very slowly, but then gets faster. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen, like I say, more growth in the last 500 years than we had seen all the time previous to that. Mm -hmm. And we've, we're going through some growing pains now, you know, the, in our in our culture. You know, growing pains tend to be a little on a violent side, you know, as people figure these things out and sides choose up. You get polarization and stuff. So we're kind of going through some growing pains right now. But mm -hmm. uh, it's possible that we'll that it'll turn out to be a positive result. It's also possible it could turn out to be a negative result and we'll de-evolve for a little while. But one thing I know for sure is we will eventually get there because evolution, though slow, is relentless. It, you just keep on evolving. Just like our evolution here in this virtual reality, you know, we just keep evolving. No, we don't know what we're going to look like, you know, a million years from now or 100,000 years from now. We may have great big heads because we have so much processing to do with our minds or we've you know who knows or we may have little spindly bodies because we have exoskeletons that you know lift things and do things for us or maybe it'll be just the opposite maybe we'll be you know 15 feet tall and uh, who knows but we won't be just the same that's unlikely mm -hmm. that we'll be just the same you know just the 200,000 years that we've that we've seen from the first homo sapiens you know we're we're fairly different. You know, if you saw a, a 200,000 year old Homo sapien and put it next to you and me, it wouldn't be hard for somebody to tell, you know, which one was the, was the original Homo sapien. You know, there's, there's been a lot of changes have been made. So there'll be more changes. And that's just 200,000 years. As things accelerate and we become capable of bioengineering and other things, you know, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. And again, the more you learn, the easier it is to learn more. You know, technologies like that too. It accelerates. The more you have, the easier it is to invent more. So growth is like that too. The big, the big unknown is: will we grow up fast enough to deal with the power that the technologies? So we have this technology growth curve, and then we have this human quality growth curve. And you don't want one to get too far, you know, you don't want the technology growth curve to get too far ahead of the quality growth curve. Otherwise, we're liable to de-evolve, take a big step backwards and have to chug back up that hill again. So yeah. that's, that's one of the dangers of growing up. Is that Not only do you uh, grow up and become more like love but you also become smarter and smarter about ways to kill everybody too yeah it's all part of the same thing you know mm -hmm. that's our that's our challenge is to is to grow up quickly enough that uh, we can make good choices when we deal with these big big weighty choices that are coming up upon us very fast you know ai is just first you know big weighty challenge that's it's going to hit us and going to change everything in the next decade and we have other things so if we don't do some some quick growing you know we're going to be uh, way behind the power curve we'll have more change than we will have ability to deal with that change and that is not a a good thing so we'll we'll see how yeah. we do but we're in the interesting part you know the part back you know five centuries ago you know everything was just the way it was five centuries before that it didn't it didn't change much but 
the changes are happening fast now and they're going to just keep happening faster and faster and faster yeah. and we're going to have to put a little more acceleration into our personal growth and lowering our entropy or we're going to need an awful lot of good luck yeah <laughs> one yeah. one or the other i wouldn't depend on good luck true uh Uh, Tom, there's one last question, and I promised my remote viewing colleagues uh, to ask that question. Uh, what would you do or what would you practice in order to become a better remote viewer? Uh, a better remote viewer. Well, you know, the first thing, you know, what you're really practicing is developing your intuitive side. It's this, it's this in, intuitive developing and there's lots of intuitive exercises you can do that would help you become a remote a better remote viewer because if you become more intuitive you'll just naturally be remote viewing will just be easier remember all the things that keep you from remote viewing or keep you from being good at it are just things you need to get rid of it's not it's not a new skill you need to learn it's just the junk you need to offload is the problem one of the one of the uh, things i thought was a lot of fun was there was this exercise where they had a, a bunch of colored cups, blue, red, yellow, orange, whatever, and they had colored balls that were the same colors. You had this blindfold on, and somebody would hand you a ball in your hand, and you'd have to put it in a cup of the same color intuitively. You couldn't see the cups. You couldn't feel the cups. They were in front of you, so you knew about where they were, and you could reach out and find them. But uh, And it's the same, you see, as remote viewing. If you got the ball and then thought about it, it, was, it was, you were hopeless. You know, that wasn't going to work. You know, it's the first thing that came to you. You know, it's the same thing as you get in remote viewing. In order to, to remote view, it, it uses your intuition. You get this information intuitively. And you have an intent to get certain information. Or you have an intent to get a, this yellow ball into the yellow cup. It's the same thing. It's exercising the same thing. And you can practice with that. And I saw some of the people who were good of it, good at it, and they could stuff balls in the right cup as fast as you could hand them to them. They could grab a ball, stuff it, grab a ball, stuff it, grab a ball, stuff it, just like they had eyes that they could see with. And the way they mm -hmm. did it is if you ask them, well, what's that like to be able to do that? And they'd say, oh, I just, I just butt out of the picture. I let my arm put it wherever it wants. I stop trying to control the arm or the hand. It just gets the ball, and I give it the freedom to go anywhere it wants to. Yeah. And it goes all by itself and, and does that. And I don't have, I'm not figuring anything out. I'm just sitting back here. You, you go, arm. <laughs> you do it. Do what you want to do. You know, I'm just sitting here. And, but first, before you can do that, you have to learn to trust the arm. Let the arm well be able to find the right cup. So trusting the arm requires you to get rid of some beliefs. Trusting the arm, that's stupid. What do you mean trust an arm? You know, my arm doesn't know a damn thing about anything, particularly what, what color ball is in it. You know, I'm not that blind guy. I can't tell the color of the ball by, the, by touching it. So it helps you get rid of the beliefs and gets rid of the things that are gone. So you, that's a game that you can practice. There's other games like that that are just intuitive. Um, uh, you know, somebody puts a, you know, a, a letter or a picture up you know, on, you know, what's this? Okay, what's this? What card am I holding? You know, whatever. Just those, mm -hmm. those kind of simple things. Um, and you can do it just with your, just in life. Um, you're sitting at a, you're sitting, um, you know, in your car waiting for your significant other to get done in the store and come out and get in the car. So while you're sitting there, you know, uh, when's, when, when does the next red vehicle make a, a right turn come into my view? All right. I want to say it just a second before it arrives. All right. Now's a red one, you know, and does a red car show up? Well. All the things you have to learn are the same things you have to learn to remote view. The, the information will come into your head immediately. 
You have to stop trying to get the right answer. You have to stop your intellect from trying to judge the answer. You have to stop trying to make an intelligent, rational process out of it because it's not a rational process. You know? And if you can practice it in a hundred ways, just in your everyday life, uh, with games, balls and cups, with uh, card decks, shuffle cards, turn them over. Make it easy at first. You know, I, I uh, is the next card, uh, you know, a six or higher or a five and lower. So now you've made it a little easier, right? It's a it's a bigger a bigger basket that you're that you're trying to shoot for. Okay. Well, if you do that and you succeed, then ask yourself, what did I feel like? What was it like just before I succeeded? What was what was my feel? What was kind of the tone of myself and my body? And how was I in my mental space when I succeed? And then you ask yourself, and how was I in my mental space when I don't succeed, when I get it wrong? And it'll be obvious to you in your mental space where you get it wrong. You're anxious. You're trying to get it right because you have to stop trying to get it right. As much as you try to get it right, you'll get it wrong. It's the trying is an intellectual thing. It's the intellect yep. trying to butt in and do what it does. You know, it says, I know how to do this. You can't get there if you don't try. Well, not on the intuitive side. <laughs> you can't get there if you do try <laughs> on the intuitive side. You have to let the intuitive side operate in its own way with its own tools. And you can make up tools if you have problems without tools. Uh, all right, uh, you know, the red car is going to come around the corner, and just before it does, I'm going to see a, a red splotch in front of me. I'm just going to see this red splotch in front of my eyes when it, just before a red car turns that corner. You know, and you can work with that. Now, that's a tool where now the red splotch becomes your, your sign rather than having to get the data from a database because that's kind of, uh, you know, not quite as, as buttoned down as a red splotch shows up in front of your eyes. So if you want to make it a little simple, you can make tools for yourself like that. So it makes the process of getting the information simpler. But now it also slows you down because in general, you have to make up tools for various situations, which will slow you down and apply the tool and so on. Whereas if that stuff just came to you naturally, then it would be a lot easier. You see, so tools are good, but tools have a downside. You know, they have a, a limitation as well. Yeah. So you realize that and work with tools. That doesn't mean avoid tools. Work with tools, but work with them knowing they're tools and that you don't want to get solely dependent on them. You want them to help you get better, but then you want to wean yourself off of it. You know, and that takes a little effort, but you can. You can wean yourself off the tool. And you then just get a feeling when the car is going to be red. You just know it, all right? It's not as obvious as a red splotch, but eventually that knowing will become very precise and not, and not so vague. So it's just practice. So you can practice your remote viewing in any number of 100 different ways, and all of them will basically be practicing your intuition. It's all intuitive practice because it's your intuition. It's your intuitive processing. You know, that's why humans have a right brain and a left brain. You know, the right brain is is more there for intuitive, you know, it does its intuitive processing, and the left brain does its logical, and that's in our avatar. Well, our avatar is like that because it helps us. The avatar, in some ways, is a reflection of us. It changes to suit our needs. It evolves to suit our needs. So it, uh, we, we, our avatar affects us in the sense that we can't do anything that isn't allowed by the rule set. So, because we do everything through our avatar. So if, you know, we can't say avatar, flap your arms and fly away. 
because the rule set doesn't support flapping arms and flying away because human joints couldn't flap fast enough that these hands could move enough air that would ever make us fly away. You know, yeah. so we're just not made that way. We can't jump 10 feet in the air either. We just don't have the muscle, the joints, the, the whatever to do that sort of thing. So you have, you're limited by what you can do by the rule set. So if your avatar is in an accident and has some kind of brain damage, well, now you have to operate that avatar with brain damage because that's the rule set. And it doesn't damage you, the consciousness, but you have to work an avatar that has limitations. Mm -hmm. Well, even if your avatar is perfectly normal in all ways or even brilliant, you still have there's still limitations there that you have to work with. So that's how the avatar affects us. It, it provides the limitations of the, of the rule set are provided you know, to the consciousness player has to abide by the rule set. But on the other hand, if we have, well, here's a, here's a negative example. If we as consciousness tend to be negative and we're, we're sad and we're unhappy and we blame everybody else for, for the things we don't like in our life and so on, then that will cause us to say, produce less serotonin. Because the body will change to kind of reflect the consciousness. So it also works the other way. The body also, in, in some ways, will, will modify itself to suit the consciousness. So then pretty soon, you know, your, your avatar goes to the doc and the doc says, oh, you've got low serotonin. Here, we'll give you a pill. You know, we'll help you boost that serotonin. And then you take the pill and it does make you feel better. You see? So the chemistry the chemical pill will add to your serotonin but the reason why you have because you're depressed but the reason why you had the serotonin the need for the serotonin and you know the pill the need for the pill in the first place was because you were depressed hmm. so it helps the symptom the medicine helps you with the symptom but it doesn't help you with the problem no See, that's the that's the key so your attitudes and your thoughts and whether you're negative or positive will change things around you, even to the matter of changing your physical, your physical self can change. Not a whole lot, but there's changes, particularly in the biochemistry area, you know, changes are, are uh, not so hard to, to make. So your attitude makes those changes. A, a, a famous example of that is there was a early on, uh, Oh, I don't know. This is a long time ago. I, I, I read about this. Uh, there was a sheep, mother sheep, and she uh, took care of another uh, sheep, I guess, sheep or female. Rams are male. Let's just pretend that's the way it is anyway. I'm not sure if that's, that's true. But anyway, she took care of another sheep's young. She let them uh, suckle along with hers. And the People thought that was extremely unusual because we know that biology just says that, you know, you're, you're trying to get your genetic material moved into the future and taking something away from your lambs that have your genetic material to feed this other lamb that doesn't have any of your genetic material is counterproductive to that. So our, our evolution would then have us be more self-centered and less caring and less giving. So, but anyway, here was this lamb that was doing things unusual and was, was very, being very kind to these, to this lamb that was not hers. And they, uh, looked at the, I won't say, you know, I usually say, so they kill, they kill the lamb, of course, because the lamb's now scientifically interesting, right? So they kill the lamb and they look at the lamb's brain and they said, Oh, look, this lamb has a little lobe here, this, which is in humans is the lobe that uh, has to do with altruism and caring, you know, for others. So somehow she developed that lobe, and that lobe allowed her then to be caring and giving. But of course, that was exactly backwards. The lamb, just like everything else, just like humans, is making choices, and by those choices, it evolves or de-evolves. It had made choices, and because of the choices it made, that lump had to grow there on her brain to give those choices some root in the rule, in the rule system. 
So it helped her evolve. So it works both ways. So that lamb mm -hmm. created that lobe there by her choices, not that the lobe somehow magically appeared there out of you know, some magic thing happened and it just appeared there and that made her, you know, nicer toward other creatures. So it works. There's influences both ways. So we're we're kind of tied in ways to our avatars while we while we have them. And we can hurt those avatars or help them. And we change things. We change probabilities. The you know the future probable database I was talking about. We can change the probabilities in that future probable database. So we can make something that was not probable more probable, and something that was more probable less probable, just with our intent. And that is something that was allowed for us to do as a feedback. Now, the world we get. It's a very accurate reflection of who we are. We create. You know, that gives us an ability to create the world we live in mm -hmm. to, a, to some extent. I mean, we don't recreate it all. Obviously, there's other things outside of our ability to, to manipulate. But there's one that is inside our ability, and that is if, if we're very uh, negative, then we create more negativity. Around mm -hmm. if we're positive, we create more positivity around us. And if we're positive, good things usually happen to us. Nice things happen to us. And if we're positive and intuitive, everything we need falls at our feet just just as we need it. You know, life is, is very bountiful that way. Whereas if we're very negative, you know, nothing falls at our feet just as we need it. Everything just as we need it becomes impossible to get. And that's because when you're negative, those worries, those thoughts, that negativity helps raise the probabilities of negative things happening to you. You help make the world more negative as it interacts with you. And if you're positive, those things that might have happened to you that were negative become less likely. And the things that would happen to you that are positive become more likely. So you feed that, that thing. So that's... That's one of the reasons why being serious about growing up, getting rid of your fear, is such a great idea. Because you'll become happier, your relationships will all get better, your life will be better, and and uh, in general, your level of satisfaction in you know with your life and with yourself and with everything around you will just grow a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's that's quite a good carrot, you know. If you talk about the carrot and the stick, you know the that's how you train a, a donkey, right? With carrots and sticks. Carrots are the are the positive inducements, and sticks are the negative inducements. So, yeah, I don't know where exactly I was going with that, but that's where it ended up anyway. So, <laughs> wow, Tom, thank you very much. This was highly interesting, uh, fantastic conversation. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, your remote viewers, if they want to get better, just play games all the time yeah. in life, yeah. you know, in just in the process of life. Who's going to come through the door next? Uh, who's, you know, what's going to happen? Who's going to win the Who's going to win the the uh, the prize at the at the next office? Uh, you know, whatever, you know, the raffle or something like that. Mm -hmm. Things that you don't know, trying to, to you know, trying to find out what are the answers to things all around you that you don't know, but find them out intuitively. Open yourself to what's the best way to drive home tonight. And mm -hmm. if you get an idea, oh, I should take the long route instead of the short route, and then you find out that there was a lot of accidents, cars piled up on the short route. There are those kinds of things. Paying attention to those feelings that just pop into your head. And being yeah. able to, with practice, sort the ones that are useful from the ones that aren't. You know, and there'll be a difference, but the difference is subtle. And the only way to get to the point where you recognize the ones that are useful from the ones that are not is you just do it enough times that you can sort that out. So that's just experience doing it. But if you don't go out of your way to do 
you know, to do these things, then the skill will start to drop off. It's a use it or lose it kind of a kind of a thing. And eventually, of course, it'll get more. The intuition will become more automatic, and you won't actually have to ask the question anymore. You'll just have mm-hmm. you'll just have to have a need for the information, and the information will just appear without you actually having to ask for it. But that's later. That comes after. After uh, a while, after you've practiced it a while, so when you when you remote view and you just have that feeling, I nailed it, I got it, I know I did, and you do. When you do that, you hit the target dead on. And there's other times mm-hmm. when you go, oh, that didn't feel right, it didn't feel good to me. And mostly in those cases, you don't get it. Well, you have to understand what's the difference in those feelings, and when did that feeling start, and what was I doing that just as that feeling started to take place, you know, what was in my mind? What was I thinking? What was I feeling? And then you'll find ways to improve your process of how you go about doing it. So I, I guess the, the boil that all down is you have to be an active seeker for improvement and act, an active seeker for getting better in order to get better. If you just do it when you do it, but you don't actively really pursue getting better, you probably won't get much better. People yeah. who get better are the people who keep experimenting, keep trying, make up tools, throw away tools. You know, they, they're constantly engaged in trying to refine what they're doing. So that, mm-hmm. those are the people who tend to get better. The people who don't do that, okay, I've got some gift for this. I'm pretty good at it because pretty good at shutting off everything and just letting my mind be empty and you can be good at it but you probably won't get much better at it unless you really make an effort to get better at it it's one of those things that takes directed effort otherwise not much happens just by doing it you know it's not like roller skating you know if you want to get better at roller skating just go roller skating (laughs) that's all just go roller skating and and you'll get better at it and you'll get more adventuresome as you go. You know, pretty soon you'll want to roller skate backwards because you see people doing it. And then you'll want to jump up and do a, do a whole twist in the air and land on one skate because you see people doing it. And, you know, but intuition doesn't work quite like that. The intuition is you have to want to do it and you have to want to pursue it and always look at it as an experiment. Everything's an experiment. Mm-hmm. Not just a skill you learn because it's not rational. You don't learn it. You have to be it. True. You know, that's the difference. It's not a, you know, you can learn things with your intellect. Your intellect, that intellectual side can learn things. This is nothing to learn. It's just, it's the way you have to be. And when you be mm-hmm. that way, when you are that way, then it just happens. And if you pay attention, you'll know what are the signs when it when it's correct and when it's not. You'll understand what the difference is, what the difference in your attitude was. Um, anyway, things like that. You know, if you're having trouble with your intellect, then butting in all the time, then you should probably go back and just do some basic meditation, which is to get the intellect to sit down and be quiet. You know, that would be a good exercise until that's easy. Remote viewing is going to be hard. <laughs> if you can't sit down and get your intellect to, to be quiet, say, for an hour or a half an hour, you know, then remote viewing is going to be difficult. Yep. You know? <laughs> so just doing the, some of the basics like that, where your mind isn't always flitting around, that you can just sit there empty without thought. That that's easy to do. So there's lots of of uh, basic things like that, but it's all intuitive. And the other thing that you'll find, Timo, is that you can, the same intuitive skills that you learn, you can use to do mind-to-mind communications, out-of-body, all those things, all work from the same set of intuitive skills. Now, each one of them has their own little set of processes. For going about it. So the processes you have to relearn, you have to redevelop those processes. So if you're going to remote view and you want to go out of body or you want to do mind to mind, you'll have to 
develop a whole set of new processes to do that. They're not the same, but they all use the same intuity skills. So once you get the processes down and get the tools that you need, you'll find that very quickly you'll get you'll get good at it pretty well. And one last thing to let your 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 folks know is that you know think about the uh, you know boy boy that was raised by a wolf. Think of Wolf Boy, mm-hmm. okay? There's lots of stories, you know, mostly fiction, but even some almost perhaps true, you know, if you can believe them. Stories where people who were totally outside of society suddenly become a part of society. They don't know language. They can't speak. They don't understand concepts. They, you know, they can't interpret their reality because everything is totally foreign. They just are, they're like two-year-olds. You know, exploring, you know, picking up every rock to see, to see what it is. You know, what is a rock? And that's what happens if you have never developed your logic and your intellect. That's, what, that's why the wolf boy is like he is. He's never developed the logic part of his mind. Now, he probably has some pretty good intuition. You know, but he has never developed the logical part of his mind. So he just can't function in the world of things and stuff because all of that is is the objective world of rational stuff. Okay, so if 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 someone never learn never practices their intellectual and logical side, they end up like Wolf Boy. That's where they're stuck. Okay, now look at it on the other side. If you never practice and and develop your intuitive side, you're like an intuitive wolf boy. <laughs> Nothing mm-hmm. seems to work. Intuition is very ragged, and it, the gut feelings are wrong as much as they are right, and the whole thing seems kind of bogus and magical, you know? So if you try to develop that, then you also are just like the example of a wolf boy learns. Somebody teaches him. He learns language. He learns how to drive a car. He learns how to do this and do that. And in five years, he would never know that he was a wolf boy. He uh, he has all the social graces and all the basic knowledge that anybody needs to know to get along in the society. Well, it's the same thing with your intuition. If you take the time to learn it and practice it and develop it, then you will you will be, you know, what do we call it? adept at doing all sorts of things. You will grow up. You will probably get rid of a lot of your fears in the process because the fears will be one of those things that keep bumping you out of that state is the fear. So you'll never really get good at an intuitive space unless you get rid of a lot of your fears. Because the fears will be the stuff that comes in and, and grabs you. So all of that goes together. So it just takes practice. Now, the, the typical person in our culture is probably spent since five years old on, well, actually since birth on, honing his intellectual and logical side. They learn the names of everything. They learn alphabets. They learn language. They they learn all sorts of things how to get by in a rational world, but they learn nothing about the intuitive side. Mm-hmm. And a three-year-old is probably more intuitive than the average adult. Mm-hmm. So most of the yep. adults are walking around with a, with maybe a a, a one-year-old's you know uh, sense of of uh, mastering its intuitive side. They're babies. They're they're infants on the intuitive side. But you can, if you develop that intuitive side, you can hone it and practice it and develop it to the point that the intuitive side is more accurate and more, can we say, reliable than the intellect. Because here's the, here's the thing. That intellect has a powerful tool called logic, very powerful. But for logic to do any good, it needs a lot of information. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a lot of information, 
logic isn't worth a damn. You know, should I marry Sally or should I marry Sue? Well, what does the logic say? Logic isn't worth a damn. It can't say anything there because it doesn't have enough information. Give logic a crystal ball as to what Sally and Sue would be like for the next 20 years. Ah, that would be some information, but we don't have crystal balls. So most of our life, we're just guessing. We think we're rational, but we're not. We're not. We tend to guess a lot and go through our life that way. Okay, so you have this wonderful tool, very precise, but it lacks enough information most of the time to actually do much good. It's good at simple things. Where did I leave my car keys? Well, where was I last? last? What did I do after I got out of the car? You know, it's logic is good for those sorts of things, but those are pretty trivial compared to should I marry Sally or Sue? You know, the most important things in your life, logic is not very good at. Okay. Mm. So, very precise, powerful tool, but not enough information. Over on the intuitive side, it's just the opposite. Now, you've got an incredible amount of information. <laughs> you've got everything in that database plus more. You know, you can have, you can get direct information, you know, directly from the LCS and, you make a good relationship with the LCS. You can become a, you know, a friend you communicate with. You, know, you get just tons of wonderful, exact information. But the tool that you use to access it is real ratty because you have to not have beliefs. You have to not have fears. You have to be able to not have thoughts running through your mind all the time. You need some discipline. You, know, you have to keep your, your intellect from butting in and You've got all these issues that make it difficult for you to access it. So they're just the opposite. The intellectual side, precise, wonderful tool with hardly any information. Over on the intuitive side, all the wonderful information you could ever want, but a kind of a ratty tool that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. See? <laughs> so the, the idea here is that the, the two of them should work together. Your optimal, your optimal way to be is that your intuition and your intellect work together. And those things that the intellect does, the intuition throws over to the intellect and says, here, hey, I need some judgments on this information. Go, go make me some judgments based on your experience. And on those things that it does best, it, it, you know, it gathers the information. And the intellect is happy to get the information that it, that it gathers. So they work together. One doesn't try to bully the other. And that's really where people want to end up. So you don't want to develop the intuitive side and let the intellectual side fall on the floor or vice versa. You want to develop both of them and let them work together. Let them become friends. Let them become partners. And what you'll find when you do that is that you will live most of your life out of your intuitive side. And the intellect will just be a really neat tool that you use to help process, you know, assess, analyze, judge, all those things will help you do all those things. But you tend to live on the intuitive side and just go over to that intellectual side when you need it to do some of that analysis for you. So, but your day to day life, Tends to live on the intuitive side. It's a, it's just a, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a better place to be. Your intuitive side with all the information solves most of the problems that you have in making choices because it does have information. And it also helps you see the world from a bigger picture. With just the intellect, your picture's really small and narrow, like the horse with the blinders on. You know, this really small scope. With the intuitive side, your scope is huge. You, know, mm -hmm. you can, like you say, you you can tell what's going on on the dark side of the moon, right? If you want to, you know, you have this huge scope of things that that the information can tell you. So it tends to put you in a larger reality. The intellect kind of puts you into down in the down in the weeds manipulating the, the, the details to come up with a solution, which is necessary, but it doesn't have the same big picture. 
So you live more in the big picture and use the intellect as a as a handy tool. And the two of them work real well together. So that's kind of what you're what you're you're trying to do. But where most people in our culture are is a terribly undeveloped intuitive side and an overdeveloped intellectual side. And the intellectual side just just basically keeps kicking the intuitive side away. Intuitive side wants to work a problem. The intellect jumps in and says, I'll solve that problem for you. Let's see. Uh, Yeah, that red spot's an apple. Got it. Of course, it's not an apple. (laughs) It was something else. But, you know, the intellect will make up anything to give you to give you what appears to be a rational answer. That's part of the way the intellect works. (laughs) It is very into the appearance of rationality. So it's not above just making stuff up out of out of whole cloth to uh, to make things seem more rational. So you can't trust it too far, but uh, it does do good analysis. And sometimes analysis is just what you need. So that would be the thing. Don't get out of balance. Don't go too far, you know, into the intuition. Don't go too far to the other. Stay balanced between them. But the balance point isn't really in the middle. The balance point really is more over on the intuitive side a little bit. That's where typically you live your life. And and then... uh, Everything just flows because you you no longer really you know it's not a matter of when you when you get rid of your fear you get rid of the attitude that I I need to be able to manipulate reality to be the way I want it you just let reality be however it is and you just make the best choices yeah. you can with it as it as it happens and that is a much more stress free environment than. Uh, you know, trying to manipulate the reality to be the way you want it. So there's, there's yeah. less stress over on the intuitive side. That's something I would like to emphasize because this is exactly what I experienced when I started remote viewing um, years back, that I lost my fears, just like you said, and life is, well, it, it's different. It, it's way better and it's way more relaxed indeed, mm-hmm. yes. And I mean, I mean, of course, I see all the problems in the, on this planet i'm not blind but I, but i'm not afraid yeah 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 and that's it and the problems are just the way they are it's 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 the way we are those problems represent us that's the quality of consciousness that's in the human race and yeah all of the things that people point out is oh that's the problem and that's the problem and that's the problem those things are just symptoms they're not the problem the problem is the low quality of consciousness in the human race that's the problem Everything else is just a symptom of that problem. So going around fixing s- symptoms, you know, that's a little bit of advantage in that. It's it's nice to have a get rid of a symptom, but it's in the in the bigger picture in the longer run, it doesn't do much because that symptom will just pop back out again in some other form, if not the same form. So you don't actually gain anything important by fixing symptoms. Just maybe a little freer space to breathe in. I mean, it's nice when people act kind, but it's better when they are kind. Much better. Much better for them, particularly. So, yeah, that's, it's like that. The intuitive side will give you a bigger picture. The other thing I have to tell your people is don't believe anything. Always be skeptical of everything. If you get good going out and talking with beings out in the great beyond and you run into one of them and they tell you that what you need to do is this, that, and the other thing. You know, you got to look at that and say, no being of high quality will ever try to tell you what to do. Never. That's overriding your free will, trying to manipulate you to do something. If it's a high quality being, you're not going to be told what you should do or what you should think or how you, what your attitude should be about it. You see? So you always have to be skeptical of everything because sometimes the larger conscious system will just feed you a wrong answer as a test to see, are you thinking for yourself or are you just following directions? Sometimes you go to your remote view and you get this information and you know it's right. You know it's perfectly right. It just fits all all the right things for being right. But it tells you to, you know, go take a long walk off a short pier. You know, it tells you to do something that doesn't seem right. Well, don't do it. Don't say, ah, oh, well, I got it from, you know, 
I got a message from God or I, you know, I got this thing and there's this conspiracy going on and I need to do this. And don't be fooled. The system will often test you by giving you some bogus stuff to see whether you'll run off and be foolish or whether you will make better choices. Mm -hmm. Be skeptical of everything. But at the same time, be open to almost every possibility. There's very little in a virtual reality that, that's, un, that's impossible. Almost everything's possible in a virtual reality. So be open, open as you can be, and be as skeptical as you can be, both at the same time. That will, that will serve you well. You don't believe anything. And when it gets down to it, if you have to make a choice that you think is the right choice, but somebody or your intuition is telling you that that's the wrong choice, you have to make your, up your own mind for your own reasons. Don't do something because somebody else or something else urges you to or tells you to. You have to make up your own mind. Is that what I want to do? So if you're driving home and something says, oh, take the long way, well, it, what's the downside? You'll get home 10 minutes later. What's the upside? You'll miss a, 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 you know, a smash up. You'll, you'll miss a big, a big delay that gets you back an hour later. Well, okay. Take the long way. You know, the downside's small. But that has to be your choice, not yeah. just you following directions. Because if you follow directions, you're going to get some misinformation just to give you a little slap to say, don't do that. If you just follow directions, you're going to get some bad directions. You have to run your business out of your own free will, and you have to know why you're making the choices you're making. And because somebody told me to is not a good answer. So. Speak yeah. to your own counsel, and if it's, things aren't working, then change what you're doing. So watch the world.